Let's go live now to independent MP and member for Warringah, Zali Stegall. Thanks so much for your time, Zali Stegall. Have you been encouraged by the, the shift in rhetoric that we've heard from the government in terms of uh, gradually getting to that net zero emissions target by 2050? As I mentioned in my introduction to our chat, clearly our closest allies are very much focusing on that in this year, 2021. The government's going to have to move further, you would have thought. Absolutely. Look, there's no doubt that over the last uh, 12 to 24 months, it's been very clear that we countries around the world are needing to commit to net zero by no later than 2050. Now, Prime Minister Morrison is getting there. I would say he's crab walking. Um, obviously, he's managing his party room and there are uh, there is disruption there. But we need to show a firm commitment. The opportunity is there for us to be on the forefront. And really, um, there are so many markets and there is going to be so many opportunities. We see our trading partners, especially the US and the UK, are making this a centre point of their platform, of their diplomatic relations. Uh, they want the global community to be committing and pulling their weight. And I really urge the Prime Minister to take the Australian Federal Government to that, to legislate net zero by 2050. Your bill is currently being looked at at committee level. Um, it's got the support. It's got quite a range of, uh, you know, broad range of support from the Australian Industry Group to, to Oxfam and various other groups. But I spoke to Innes Willox from the AIG today, just a few, uh, you know, an hour or so ago. He says that your bill would be a strong framework, a strong starting point, and important to have something like that, particularly when we go into free trade talks with the EU or UK. Or they want to see that we're serious on that front. Look, absolutely. The climate change bills that I've proposed are really a sensible down-the-middle option, and that was really important because my hope was to try and unite a very divisive debate around sensible policy. Now, this is the very legislation that was passed in the UK in 2008 and has driven great developments and great emission reductions in the UK. Um, and so we have a model that we can follow. So I very much encourage the government to adopt this legislation to engage with me, engage with the private sector. The inquiry of the Environment and Energy Committee has seen over 6,500 submissions to the inquiry. The vast majority, I think it's probably 99.9 per .9 cent, are in support. But importantly, groups like BCA, like AIG, like Australian Medical Association, uh, local government association are all saying to legislate net zero, but also to have very clearly defined five year emission reductions reduction budgets will allow the private sector and especially investment to have that long-term certainty on our direction of travel. So on the one hand, yeah. we have the technology roadmap and that's great, but we need to have the drivers that will pull that technology um, roadmap in the right direction and that is to legislate net zero. And I know that you've incorporated that uh, government, the Angus Taylor roadmap in this, in this bill as well, which is which is important. And, but in terms of, you know, the, the argument that, oh, you're just uh, a lefty or if, you know, if there's going to be a response on this, it seems like that's been mugged by reality, by the corporate sector, by finance. Uh, the Australian Prudential Regulation Authority, one of the regulators, in fact, saying that climate change is actually, quote, a legally foreseeable risk facing many different companies in a range of industries... These aren't the tree-hugging uh, greenies you would have thought, APRA. This is one of the hard-headed regulators saying this is a legally foreseeable risk. Absolutely. And that's why this legislation is actually so important. This isn't left... I mean, you know, the left will say I'm too right and the right says I'm a lefty. So I think that's why I sit pretty firmly down the middle. Um, but what's really important about this legislation is, in fact, the private sector, uh, the business sector really want this. They need this certainty so that they can measure uh, and really it can drive investment. But also it can drive planning. So one of the sectors... That that's come out strong in the independent inquiry
story uh, has actually been local governments looking for how do they manage the risk to public assets. You know, something like $212 billion worth of public assets are along our east coast uh, coastline uh, at risk of uh, coastal erosion, uh, flooding, droughts, uh, climate change impacts. So we have to be very real. These are mm. very real risks. They will have an impact on the bottom line. If we want sensible economic management, we need to manage climate risk. There's a, a fair bit of pressure on the government and the Prime Minister on a very different matter. This comes to the scandals that we've seen in recent weeks, Ali Stegall, um, as to whether or not the government will implement an inquiry. It doesn't look like the Prime Minister is going to go anywhere near that, but you're saying that there is some legislative action that can happen now within the Sex Discrimination Act that can basically make um, MPs, judges, not just protected from, but liable as well for yes. sexual harassment that happens in the workplace. Yeah, the, the government commissioned a very important piece of work. We've got the Respect at Work report that came out. It was tabled in Parliament in March 2020 by Sex Discrimination uh, Commissioner Kate Jenkins. It made 55 recommendations, and a very important recommendation was that we need to amend the Sex Discrimination Act to ensure that sexual harassment is prohibited in all circumstances, in all public circumstances. At the moment, there's a, there's a grey area when it comes to judges or MPs being protected from but also liable for sexual harassment. So, um, look, a proposal was put to the Attorney-General sometime last year um, to amend the Sex Discrimination Act. Unfortunately, and I've urged the government to, uh, to own this, to, to act upon these recommendations. Um, failing a commitment to do so, I'm putting forward a private member's bill uh, on Monday the 15th of March to amend that, and I'm calling on all my... My, uh, colleagues of the 45th um, Parliament, sorry, 46th Parliament, um, to uh, to make this change so that the public at large can feel that this is a Parliament that's acting on sexual harassment amidst very serious allegations and really quite big scandals that are impacting the trust Australian people have in our government and, and in our institution. Did, while you're taking that legislative action, do you accept the... the other argument in terms of it's a separate uh, response, that being argued by the Greens and Labor and others, that the Prime Minister needs to in implement an independent investigation. Do you accept his argument that the, 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 the normal course of action via the South Australian authorities needs to be exhausted first and that's the priority? Look, well, we've had a number of scandals. So we, uh, the amendment to the Sex Discrimination Act has actually come about as a result of Brittany Higgins coming forward with her allegations. We saw the independent inquiry that's now going into the workplace. Um, and now since then, we've also now got the allegations in respect to the Attorney-General. Um, they're very serious and very concerning allegations. And whilst there is the police route of investigation and, of course, then the coronas, uh, coronial inquest route as well. Um, there are larger questions around the role of the Attorney-General and that that person should be a fit and proper person. This is the highest lawmaker in the land, giving legal advice to government. And the Australian public do need to be satisfied that that is a role being carrying out carried out um, at the utmost level. So I do feel there is a an onus on the Prime Minister to show leadership with this, like Chief Justice uh, Kiefel did in the, with the High Court, in having an, uh, in, a, an investigation into the allegations to ensure that this is properly weighed up and the role is being carried out in the best interest of the nation. Um, the Attorney-General is an incredibly important role. Who should lead that investigation? What sort of setup would you envisage? Look, again, I would take uh, my uh, cue, I guess, from the High Court investigation. Uh, it was done... Uh, it it was done very, uh, I'd say, uh, sensitively, uh, confidentially. It was an administrative review of the allegation. It was not intended to uh, 
uh, overrule any kind of rule of law or get in the way of any criminal investigation. This was an internal review of processes and how, uh, you know, what was the facts behind the allegations. Now, I do feel the Prime Minister needs to uh, engage with the allegations that have been made against the Attorney General. I would urge him to read uh, the allegations. I certainly think that's an important first step in understanding the seriousness of the matter, but also um, that whether the coronal inquest is appropriately resourced to look into this, but also the, the fitness um, and the appropriateness and the trust in the role of the Attorney General goes beyond what a coronial inquest would look at. So my concern is, uh, again, I, there's no easy answer to this, but I think the Australian public is looking at these issues needing to be more resolved than what we have at the moment, which is, uh, you know, uh, incredibly distressing for um, uh, the complainant, her family, but also the Attorney-General and, and his reputation. I think this needs uh, a more proactive uh, investigation to uh, get to the bottom of it and see what can be, what recommendations and what outcome will be in the best interest of the public. Zali Stegel, I appreciate your time today. Thanks. Thank you.